Okay, we're going to begin now. I am Dr. Heather McCarty, and I, along with Dr. Catherine Michael and Dr. Kyle Livy, are the co-directors of the Lytton Center for History and the Public Good. We want to welcome everyone to today's talk, Protest Nation, Anti-U.S.-Based Struggle in Post-War Japan by Dr. Dustin Wright. Before we introduce Dr. Wright, I want to share a bit about the Lytton Center by reading our written statement, or sorry, our mission statement. The Lytton Center considers the ways that the study of the past can help shape the present and future. Our mission is to inspire the Ohlone community to work for the public good through programming focused on access, equity, inclusion, justice, and service. The Lytton Center explores challenges facing our community and the world, past, present, and future, and fosters big ideas that will inspire and transform Ohlone and the larger community for the better. Through training, programming, and capacity building, the Lytton Center empowers students to advocate for a just and equitable world. And we are excited today to have you all here in this talk. And now I will hand things off to Dr. Kyle Libby so that he can introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Dustin Wright. Um, Dr. Dustin Wright is a historian and assistant professor of Japanese culture and language at California State University, Monterey Bay. His research focuses on Japanese and Okinawan history, social movements, and Asia Pacific food histories. He is currently writing a book on the social histories of anti-military based protests in Japan, and his work has been published in the Japan Times, Critical Asian Studies, the 60s, and Gastronomica, the Journal of Food Studies. He is also an associate director of the Okinawa Memories Initiative, a community history and dialogue project. He, like myself, is also always accepting restaurant re re recommendations. It's our pleasure to introduce Dr. Dustin Wright. Thank you very much for that um, introduction, Kyle. And, and thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Heather, and thank you, uh, Ohlone College and the Lytton Center for the invitation to uh, come and, and, and join you today and speak uh, as part of your, your speaker series. It's a real uh, pleasure and an honor, so thank you. And, and uh, I look forward to, at some point, visiting your campus uh, in person, um, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, yeah, so, uh, as, uh, as Kyle said, um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, protest in, in Japan. And, and I understand that this is uh, maybe uh, that my talk on, on Japan is somewhat related to an expansion of the curriculum at Ohlone to include um, other courses in, in East Asian history. And so that was really uh, exciting to hear about. So I'm really, really thrilled to hear that. Um, let me go ahead and I will share my screen. Um, I'm going to uh, um, give the talk along with a, 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 a keynote PowerPoint, a keynote here. So hold on one second. Okay. Is that looking okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, well, I will begin. Um, I, I begin by showing this image here. And this is a, a, a photo that I took in uh, 2015 um, outside of Shibuya Station, which is in central Tokyo. And this was at a rally that was organized by a group uh, that was called SEALDS. And that stood for Students Emergency Action for Liberal Democracy. And at the time, that group was uh, mostly uh, an organization that was organized by uh, university students. And they were um, protesting plans by the administration of then Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, who was trying to um, uh, galvanize the government to reinterpret Japan's constitution to allow for the Japanese self-defense forces to have a more robust um, outward military uh, project. Right now, the, the Constitution of Japan, which I'll talk about today, um, limits the extent to which the Japanese self-defense forces can engage in armed conflict abroad, uh, ostensibly sort of um, limiting any kind of action to purely defensive measures. 
Um, but the government was trying to reinterpret the constitution to suggest that the Japanese military could join, um, or for example, could join uh, multilateral military missions abroad. And so for a lot of people in Japan, this kind of movement by the, um, by the government to um, create a more robust interpretation of what the Japanese military is allowed to do was worrisome and felt like a pro-war sort of uh, moment. Um, and so uh, I went to this protest uh, simply to observe and was really struck by, and I hope that the photo sort of captures this, uh, the really diverse group of people who came to this protest. I saw young and old. I saw uh, male and female. Um, it seemed to be a, a people from sort of all walks of, of society attending this, this rally. And so I want to begin with this just to give you a sense that, you know, I'm talking about a historical moment um, and I'm looking at uh, the history of activism and anti-military and anti-military base protest in Japan. But just to give you a sense that this is an ongoing effort and this is an ongoing discussion and an ongoing uh, topic in Japan. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, some of these signs, we won't let you go to war, no to the war bill. And then you can see over here uh, the prime minister depicted as the Grim Reaper. So I'm going to talk to you today about protest, uh, anti-base protest in Japan, and I'm going to focus primarily on a groundbreaking struggle that erupted uh, in the small town of Sunagawa in western Tokyo in the 1950s. These grassroot pro grassroots protests began when local families, many of whom were farmers, refused to allow a base runway to be expanded onto their lands. And I argue that this anti-base movement, which became known as the Sunagawa struggle, is significant not only for delivering the strongest legal rebuttal to the presence of American bases in Japan, but it also helps us reassess Japan and Tokyo's post-war history, in particular a military-driven type of urbanization, through the eyes of the people who lived there at the time, um, and challenged the military's monopolization of, of lived spaces. So the story that I'm going to tell you um, that demilitarization never happened in Japan after the war, when in fact demilitarization after World War II was one of the main goals of the American occupation of Japan. It was something that, Jap uh, that the American occupation forces at the end of World War II and something that many Japanese people agreed with. Demilitarization, democratization, let's have it, bring it on. Um, but it wasn't quite that easy. And this is obvious, you know, it, throughout Japan today, and perhaps mostly so in Okinawa, where protests against military bases uh, are ongoing. And that's something I researched with the Okinawa Memories Initiative, which Kyle uh, mentioned when he was introducing me. And that is a student and community dialogue project. And, and it's something I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A if anybody's interested. But for now, I'm going to pay attention to, to Sunagawa. And because it's there in Sunagawa in the 1950s that we can get a a clear idea of a concerted revolt against militarization that many had hoped had ended with World War II. So I'm going to give away a spoiler here as well. These protests in Sunagawa, unlike many other protests, uh, these protests actually won. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Tachikawa Air Base. Tachikawa Air Base uh, and the base town milieu from which the Sunagawa struggle, um, uh, excuse me, from which the Sunagawa struggle uh, emerged, this base was originally established as a Japanese military base by the army in 1916, and it was an airfield and a flight school. The purchase, even at that time, was not without dispute among the locals who lived in that area. During this time, two-thirds of all pre-war farmers were tenant farmers, so they didn't own their land. And many of the landowners were absentee. So when the military announced that they were going to build this new airfield, which was going to occupy farmland, many of these tenant farmers protested the sale of the land because they weren't going to get any money out of it, right? They didn't actually own the land. Um, at one rally, a group of 40 or 50 tenant farmers gathered for a potluck at a representative home and called for what they saw as their right to livelihood. The rally was even big enough to warrant a, a visit from the police and a warning. Eventually, this round of land negotiations was settled by returning three years of land rents 
to the tenant farmers. So this is early in, in Tachikawa's history. And this image that I've showed you here, um, that I'm showing you, is uh, basically the entirety of the, of the Kanto Plain in what you know we could say loosely as uh, the Tokyo Megalopolis, which includes a lot of different cities, Yokohama um, and Tokyo and, and a bevy of others, uh, much bigger cities and, and several prefect pe prefectures uh, as well. Um, but you know, for those of us in California, I might just mention that there are about as many people living in this area here of Tokyo Megalopolis as there are in the entirety of California just to give you a sense of the population there, right? It's, you're looking at about 40 million people um, in this area. During this time, this time of, of early 19-teens 19, uh, 19 into the 1920s, writings by Sunagawa locals portray the base as a space of curiosity and wonder. Let me show you uh, another image here. So I'm gonna be mentioning a couple of words, uh, Tachikawa, it sounds kind of like Sunagawa, but they're different terms, in, in fact. So uh, the name of the base is Tachikawa Air Base. The name of this city here is also Tachikawa. But I'm going to be talking a lot about this village here, and this village is called Sunagawa. So just to give you a sense of, of the, some of the terms that I'm talking about. Um, but Sunagawa locals refer to the base in almost sort of romantic terms during this time. Miyaoka Masao, who would later lead protests against the Tachikawa Air Base, was a child in this area in the 1920s. Uh, and he remembers, quote, unlike the American base, which is surrounded by a fence, at the time when I was a kid, you could enter and leave from anywhere. As kids, we would walk across the base and go fishing in the Tama River. I remember chasing big grasshoppers that could fly 100 meters over the wide grass fields. Miyaoka also remembered European visitors making stops in Tachikawa as they circumnavigated the globe. In 1924, which was his third year of elementary school, he stood with his Japanese flag-waving peers to, set, to uh, see off the first Japanese plane to ever fly to Europe. And of course, these romantic childhood memories of a militarized space actually belie the true use of Tachikawa Air Base. The base was central to the development of Japan's wartime aeronautical manufacturing sector. And it was a major air link to Japan's expanding colonial pro, uh, apparatus in Asia, particularly in Manchukuo. Um, this is northwest, uh, northeast China, excuse me. This painting that I have here uh, by Iwata Sentaro uh, is hanging in the uh, um, Tokyo National Museum of Art. And it depicts uh, kamikaze pilots standing on the grassy uh, runways of Tachikawa Air Base um, as part of a sending off ceremony. And you can see from this painting, right, I think this, this feeds into what, what I'm calling this romantic Tachikawa moment of despite it being a war uh, and a place that was built um, um, increasingly for war potential, um, there's an image of it as being somewhat uh, pastoral. And, and beautiful in a sense. So you don't really see in this painting, for example, uh, military equipment. Um, it's in fact kind of a, a somewhat warm, somewhat somber uh, kind of painting, but doesn't really depict necessarily the violence um, and, and uh, that we sometimes may associate with something like uh, the, the kamikaze pilots. And this other image here just depicts an aeronautical gathering uh, on the airfield. Um, uh, sort of celebrating uh, a flight. But it was a, a, a base town and it was a military base. So because of this reason, Tachikawa and the surrounding towns were heavily targeted by American bombers during World War II, uh, throughout 1945 in particular. So this image here is a photo taken from an American bomber um, and it shows you uh, the after effects of, of a bombing run. This was in uh, April uh, April 24th, actually. So, um, you know, uh, we're kind of near the anniversary of that, but this was April 24th, 1945. Um, and, you know, we might sort of recognize as well that, uh, as was the case in other bombing campaigns during the war, much of the base was actually not bombed. Um, in fact, the military, the, the U.S. military often targeted the areas around the base 
uh, the communities and the, the dormitories and the factories around the base because the Americans understood that after the end of the war, uh, they would likely use those bases. And so they didn't want to destroy the runways and, and the facilities that they didn't feel they needed to uh, so that they could use them quickly at the end of the war. I want to take a moment to say that I understand militarism to mean different things to different people in Japan's 20th century. It's a term and a concept that is very much historically contingent. Militarism and the militari militarization of landscape was for the young Miyokas and other children of that era who chased grasshoppers across a grassy airfield, a reflection of Japan's industrialization and a symbol of the wonder that came with new technologies. During the war, however, militarism was a process that militarized people's everyday lives and subordinated civilian needs to those of the military itself. When the US landed in Tachikawa, at the end of the war in September 1945, the military quickly set up repurposing the massive base for its own uses, which included turning part of it into the headquarters for the Far East Asia Command, FICOM. The continued militarization fueled accidents and crimes, which were major issues around Tachikawa throughout the 1940s and the 1950s. Let me give you some examples. In the early evening of June 18, 1953, a U.S. Air Force C-124 Globemaster fell out of the sky shortly after taking off from Tachikawa Air Base, killing all of the 129 Korea-bound passengers, mostly U.S. soldiers. At the time, this was the deadliest aviation accident in global history. On September 20th, 1955, right as protests in Sunagawa against the base were um, really heating up, uh, another plane fell out of the sky in western Tokyo, this time in the suburb of Hachioji, just a few train stops away from Tachikawa. The jet crashed into a farming neighborhood and killed four people. There was crime as well. One of the more shocking examples occurred in 1947, when five U.S. soldiers from Tachikawa drove a jeep through the streets of nearby Hachioji, and randomly clubbed to death five different Japanese people with, uh, with two by fours and injured 20 others. This incident, shocking though it was, was not reported in the heavily censored Japanese newspapers in which disparaging or incriminating stories related to the US military were redacted. This and a large number of less violent incidences resulted in many of the bases sur surrounding towns passing resolutions that prohibited US personnel from entering the town limits once the American occupation ended. Industrial pollution from the military base was a, a, also caused considerable hardship for the local populations in the surrounding communities. From 1947 until 1945, uh, 1954, numerous contaminated water wells were uncovered in the vicinity of Tachikawa Air Base and the nearby Yokota Air Base. These are both big American Air Force bases. In 1947, residents of the Takamatsucho and Fushimicho districts of Tachikawa noticed that their wells were contaminated with oil and gasoline that had seeped from the base into the groundwater, producing what they called flaming wells. A tofu maker in town noticed that their product was turning purple and um, Maybe not everybody here eats tofu, but it should not be purple. The flowers in the local florists quickly wilted. A movie theater caught fire when a nearby river combusted. One 1948 study determined that 86% of the wells in the Takamatsucho neighborhood, just east of the Tachikawa Air Base, were polluted. In April 1952, this is four years later, it was found that 3,000 wells used by over 6,000 households in downtown Tachikawa were polluted so badly that, quote, one third of the population lacks even one cup of water to drink. It was rumored that some wells were so polluted with gasoline that soldiers from the base were using the wells to fill their automobiles. That's just a rumor. I don't know if that's true, but um, that's what uh, somebody reported in, in some of the archives. Despite the clear link of the pollution to the base, the U.S. military maintained that the gasoline and oil were not originating from the base, 
and the military denied any responsibility. So this image here is of a, uh, a water delivery truck that is going into these neighborhoods and, and delivering water to those uh, whose wells were too polluted to use. Militarized urbanization placed other pressures on the landscape and the environment. At the behest of the US uh, military, bulldozers ran roughshod over much of Sunagawa town and property owners were dispossessed of their land, often without payment. From 1946 to 1953, the US military expanded the base several more times, which brought the base to roughly 2.5 uh, kilometers squared in size. The table here illustrates the most significant moments when locals were dispossessed of their land, um, not just during the American era, but in the pre-war uh, uh, Japanese era as well. Not only is it evident that the US military lost no time in repurposing and expanding Tachikawa Air Base, but it also seemed to be growing uh, without restraint, much like Tokyo itself during this time. It's also around uh, this moment when, um, when land is being appropriated that the population of Sunagawa was increasing as well. From 1945 to 1955, the population increased from 8,900 to uh, 12,500, an increase of 40, 42%. The steady increase in population and residences and the increased pressure on the landscape of Sunagawa was another reason that the base expansion projects um, caused significant hardships to locals, particularly those who were farmers. Of course, at the same time with this urbanization, with this base town uh, growth, um, new positions and new uh, forms of labor were introduced into the area. In 1946, uh, not long after the end of the war, there were approximately 600 women working in the sex trade in Tachikawa. By 1952, there were 5,000. Nishida Minoru, a writer, prostitution abolitionist, and amateur ethnographer, took it upon himself to bear witness to the transformation of this area from a military aircraft industrial town to one under the domination of a foreign military. The Tachikawa of 1947, Nishida wrote, wasn't like the colonized Sin City of 1950 or 1951. I saw the women of the night who accompanied the soldiers of Tachikawa Air Base. Special women, tokushu josei was the term, swarming around the city, showing the soldiers around with reckless abandon. In Tachikawa, this place that he called the city of black markets and drugs, the sex industry had grown to such an extent that brothels, cabarets, and bars had become the primary establishments around the base. The women from around the war-ruined war country were drawn to the region in order to provide that labor. Um, this next image is a bit graphic, so I will give a, a bit of warning. This image comes from a book called uh, Yoru no Kichi, so Base at Night or Night Base. Um, and the author uh, of that book included this image um, and described it as a sending off ceremony for soldiers, for American soldiers who were en route to the Korean War. And so this, cycle, this type of sending off ceremony would occur on the runway, um, maybe right before the soldiers are getting on to uh, the planes that are going to ferry them uh, to war. Um, and in this particular image, uh, the women, these women have been brought onto the runway, um, asked to disrobe or disrobed, and um, display their bodies for the benefit, for the amusement of the soldiers who are leaving. And in this image, the women appear to be um, covering themselves with their arms, and the soldier just to the right um, appears to be suggesting that they should open their arms and, and expose their bodies uh, to the gaze of the soldiers who are waiting. And I, I show this image because it strikes me for a couple of reasons. One, because of the uh, um, clear uh, um, sort of sexual violence imbued in the image, but also that this image is, is taken during the day, right? That this is happening in the middle of a runway uh, in clear daylight um, in a base town, uh, a base town in which uh, ostensibly this type of sending off ceremony was not uncommon. And if you reflect on this sending off ceremony and reflect on that imagery of the, the painting um, 
by uh, Iwata Sentaro uh, with the Kamikaze pilots standing on that same runway um, just a decade before for a very different type of sending off ceremony. Uh, the juxtaposition of these very two different worlds within the same space, I think, is quite striking. It's within this moment of accidents and pollution and base-related violence that the Sunagawa struggle emerged as the single largest anti-U.S. based movement in Japan. On May 6, 1955, an official from the Tachikawa City Land Procurement Office, a Japanese official, informed locals in Sunagawa that the main runway of Tachikawa Air Base was going to be extended, cutting the town of Sunagawa in half. Local farmers and villagers quickly set about protesting and organizing an anti-base expansion alliance. It makes sense, right? They were the ones who had the most to lose in this moment. They would lose their land, they would lose their homes, um, and thus their livelihoods. This activist community was loosely organized under the framework of the Sunagawa Town Council, but was not dependent on local authorities for permission to picket or block police or base construction crews. Two days after the Tokyo City's procurement office made the announcement, um, locals gathered again at the town hall and created the Sunagawa Anti-Base Expansion Alliance. In the coming weeks and months, the alliance was initially composed of local residents, farmers, rapidly expanded to include local unions and national unions, student groups, and members and representatives of the Japanese Socialist Party. Sunagawa's urbanizing population was also informing the composition of the growing anti-base alliance. By 1955, one third of Sunagawa's population was comprised of people who worked outside of agriculture. These people worked in businesses, they worked in public service, education. Um, roughly 600 of Sunagawa's residents also worked on the base. One result of the expanding and increasingly specialized nature of work was that labor unions, which uh, had always in, or had long enjoyed a strong role in Japanese civil society um, since the early 20th century, also increased their presence in Tachikawa and Sunagawa. So labor unions from around the wider region uh, joined this movement, in part because they saw the Japanese government's demands for more land in Sunagawa as representative of much larger issues, like Japan's Cold War alignment with the United States, and therefore the alignment with America's wars in Asia, and the coalition of uh, conservative parties that were quickly consolidating power in Tokyo. And many labor unions saw this consolidation of conservative governments in Tokyo um, as a threat to the labor movement. So you had these huge constituencies of big labor unions like the National Railway Workers Union, the immense Telecommunication Workers Union, radical student uh, university student organizations like Zengakuden, and then regional labor unions. Um, and you even had a local uh, hospital union join the protest. So this map, I've sort of zoomed out now, right? And uh, we're here back looking at the base, uh, the contours of the base, Tachiko Air Base, here's the runway expansion area. This is the neighborhood that I was talking about that experienced the, the really heavy uh, water pollution in the wells. Um, this is the site of the 1953 Globemaster crash. So that at that time, it was a watermelon field. Today, it is a driving school. Here's another large American air base, Yokota Air Base. This one is still in operation. Uh, the Americans still uh, uh, administer the space. And this is the location of Maruyama Hospital. I want to talk about that for a moment. The hospital union expressed concerns that the base expansion would create an unhealthy environment for hospital patients. Only 2.5 kilometers north of the runway, the hospital was constantly haunted by the planes that flew morning and night, and it made sleep for the hospital's patients impossible. The intense bla blasts of the jets passing over the hospital, the report read, are constantly disrupting the rest and sleep of our patients, some of whom complain of impaired breathing, and it also creates a condition where it is impossible for the doctors to listen internally um, to those patients who are coming in and puffing up blood 
and the medical staff were attributing this to uh, to the blast of the jets day and night. And the, the reasoning that the labor union had was that if the runways expanded, then therefore maybe it'll be used more, but also if it's expanded, then the planes might be flying even lower uh, over the hospital than they currently were. These unions and organizations recognized that this expanding base and the militarism on which it was predicated offered a moment to shine a light on the other issues, including the hollowness, they argued, of post-war democracy itself. The militarist bulldozing of democratic potential in the pre-war years, right, this is the Japanese militarists doing this, um, uh, in the pre-war years, looked very similar to the post-war bulldozers that threatened the village of Sunagawa. The same year, the Japanese self-defense forces were expanded greatly, and the two main conservative parties uh, consolidated. And again, these were considered dangerously anti-union, dangerously pro-American. Um, and so the labor unions really felt that this was a moment and that perhaps Sunagawa would be a good symbol and place to kind of make a stand uh, against these sort of uh, moving forces. So when I thought about militarism meaning different things to different people, this is what I meant. For the unions, the heavy handedness of the Japanese government in demanding land from farmers at the behest of the US military exhibited one of the central characteristics of the war, which was the subordination of everyday life for the sake of militarism. So labor unions in particular were targeted for censorship or banned outright by the wartime Japanese state. So it isn't surprising that unions, right, for all these reasons, um, would be quick to support a movement like the Sunagawa struggle. And let me just say that the, the process of land requisition would go like this. Um, the US military would tell their Japanese counterparts, we want this amount of land. And then local Japanese city officials would make the arrangements and clear the land. Uh, local officials are the ones who take the measurements, stake off the area, and building would commence. So at no point in this process are the locals actually engaging with Americans, right? This is all going through uh, it's all Japanese city officials communicating with Japanese locals. Um, and so basically the protests sort of would look like this. Uh, land surveyors would come out and they would start marching through people's fields. Many of these fields were potato fields at the time and start hammering in stakes, right? Land surveying, measuring. Um, and then after they left, the locals would come out, pull up the stakes, throw them across the fence back onto the base and uh, go home. <clears throat> And then the next day, the land surveyors would come back, plant the stakes. You get the picture, right? This is going on and on. Um, so eventually, the land surveyors would be escorted by police. And then a few more protesters would come out. And then the land surveyors would be escorted by uh, hundreds of riot police. And then you get thousands of protesters that are coming out. And so this escalation of the protests builds throughout 1955 and continues uh, throughout the, the mid to late 1950s. <clears throat> Sunagawa locals found that it, it was at this point of surveying um, when you could actually uh, um, have direct action, the easiest, right? The pulling up of the stakes. But local, uh, the procurement office officials, these Japanese officials from Tachikawa, um, did try to entice, right? And some people did agree to sell their land. Others did not. One, uh, a procurement office official said, even if you oppose the expansion plan, we're still going to take it. They tried to uh, offer a little bit of icing to entice them. They said, if you agree to the expansion, we'll move the Sunagawa Junior High School that is near the planned site to a place with a better environment, right? Get a new junior high school out of this. If you don't agree, the school will be in harm's way. In one incident shortly after this ultimatum, at the end of June 1955, land surveyors attempted to forcefully enter Sunagawa farmland and were met with a scrum of 300 people, including locals, affiliated labor unions, three deputy representatives of the Japanese Socialist Party who evicted them from the, from the uh, village. This is, uh, these are some images that I pulled out of uh, an archive at um, uh, the Ohada Institute in Tokyo. Um, and you can see this image here, uh, some marchers going down the main street of uh, Sunagawa, 
um, ostensibly en route to a clash with uh, uh, land surveyors. This banner uh, that you see here is from uh, the Tokyo Agricultural Union. Um, in support, let's protect Sunigawa Village, it says, uh, in, in unity. Um, and then this image here is a, uh, a, a sort of a strategy map that shows the routes that the police were taking in order to uh, confront the protesters. Uh, and so this is a map drawn by the protesters as sort of a, a, a battle strategy to understand the best ways to head off the police as they come. So you can see this is all, in this image, this is all the base here. Uh, these are the different um, uh, dates uh, and numbers of uh, um, soldiers who, uh, of police who have confronted at different points from the base. And you can see the different routes that protesters can take and then the actual runway expansion area where these clashes might take place. So these are these these this is a really well planned, really well thought out, really well organized uh, protests. For the families who lived in Sunagawa, those who most deeply felt the impact of the base expansion and the resistance it provoked, um, you know, many experiences of of everyday life were wholly permeated by the struggle. So among these families were many children. And they are sometimes the forgotten but keenly observant informants of social and family life, who witnessed and recognized the impact of the struggle in their small town. Yanagisawa Akira taught social studies and Japanese at the Sunagawa Junior High School. Remember, it's the same school that's under threat from the actual uh, runway expansion. Along with 10 other educators, Yanagisawa formed what they called the Base and Education Research Club. It was in the educational space of the classroom, Yanagisawa reasoned, where Sunagawa children would teach, um, would talk through and discuss the very political battle that was raging all around them. So from 1955 to 1957, Yanagisawa's Base and Education Research Club published three editions of Bunshu Sunagawa, the Sunagawa Collection which was a collection of poems and short essays written by students at the junior high school. As expert witnesses in their homes and villages, the, the children of Sunagawa provided unique testimony on the struggle. Paying considerable attention to these narratives, I would say, allows us to understand both how the children viewed the struggle, but also how they, un how they conveyed and interpreted their parents' and communities' impressions and opinions. I think really importantly, seeing the events of the mid to late 1950s through the eyes of these children gives us a clear idea that they lived in a society that was not yet rid of militarism. Let me give you some examples of what they wrote. Aoki Hisashi was a first year student and he was attuned to how much the near constant visits from the procurement office had altered daily life in Sunagawa. Here's what he wrote. Around Sunagawa, there isn't a time in the day when it's quiet. Even on rainy days, my whole family is wandering, is wondering when the procurement office is going to come. And looking outside, even while we're eating. Even at three o'clock tea, everybody's talking. The conversation is always about the base. Around the water well, all the aunties gossip about the base. When we see little kids and my family mumble, Americans are stupid, taking our homes without paying, stupid, stupid, every time they see Americans. The tears roll down our cheeks. When my family comes home, sometimes I listen to the grown-ups' conversations. I also sometimes listen to the shopkeepers talk in their stores. These people are all talking about the base. Another student mentioned her sadness when her classmates talked badly about the riot police, who were often in town to push back protesters. The student's own father, it turned out, was a policeman. They are not all bad people, she reflected. Fukushima Shigeko was another first-year student, and she wrote, Our town used to be peaceful, but that one thing, those planes flying just over our heads, shaking the glass windows of our classroom, those jet blasts shattering the spirits of the people walking along the road, have made this peaceful town into one of unpleasantness. In all likelihood, Shigeko had never known Sunagawa to be a place where noises of modern militarism uh, 
a place without those modern militarism noises blasting overhead day and night. She wasn't old enough to remember a time before Touch Color Air Base. The Japanese government, right, sort of pulling the lens back a bit, feared a broad anti-base movement. On August 5th, the Japanese government took the unusual step of issuing a press release that argued the case for expanding runways throughout the country for the American military, including not only Tachikawa, but also Yokota and other places that Americans had bases like Kisaradzu and Niigata. The government also asked for peace and the halting of the protests. The plea for calm was not answered. By October 1956, so this is a year after the protests had started, 1,200 police officers were ordered to evict the farmers from the land that they continued to occupy. They were met with 6,000 protesters, resulting in a clash that left roughly 1,000 people injured. Several seriously. In July 1957, during another round of protests, seven student demonstrators crossed the boundary onto the base. They were arrested and charged with trespassing, a case that was adjudicated in the Tokyo District Court. More specifically, they were charged under a law that was specifically designed, uh, specially designed to criminalize unauthorized entry onto American bases. To the surprise of many, and to the complete horror of the Japanese and US governments, the Tokyo District Court actually ruled that not only were the protesters not guilty of trespassing, but actually US bases themselves were in violation of Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. This is Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. Uh, I'll read it. Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. This is a pretty radical document, um, certainly for its time and certainly for today, right? One of the benefits of being a sovereign modern nation state is getting to decide your borders and the other one is getting to go to war with each other, right? Um, and so it's a big deal for a state to actually uh, renounce that sovereign right. In his judgment, the presiding judge, Date Akio, wrote, quote, it cannot be said that the stationing of the United States forces in our country is permitted under the Constitution. Military bases, he argued, constituted war potential. And that is prohibited really clearly in paragraph two of Article 9. And so far from sending a message that the Japanese government's seriousness in prosecuting those who violently oppose the military expansion, um, the Date ruling delivered a powerful blow to the central component of the US-Japan military agreement, which was that the US had the right to militarize much of Japan's landscape. You know, why did Date rule this way? Tachikawa was not the only military base in the region. Tokyo was a place that is uh, dotted with American military bases. Um, you know, uh, when you include offices and barracks and other facilities, we can estimate that there were, as there are now, at least three dozen U.S. military facilities scattered throughout the Tokyo megalopolis. So one result of that was that the Tokyo region was really dense with it, uh, dense with military bases. And so the promise of being free of militarism, militarism which was acknowledged by both the Japanese and the U.S. governments as having been the root cause of World War II in the Pacific, uh, had not been realized. So the Japanese government's response to this was to kick it up to the Supreme Court. Nine months later, the highest court in Japan ruled that the bases were indeed constitutional and paved the way for the government's re-signing of a deeply unpopular security agreement uh, with the US during what are known as the Ampo protests, these famous protests in the 1960s against the re-signing of this security treaty. So the Supreme Court's decision to overturn the Date judgment was in part due to carefully crafted language in the peace treaty um, that ended uh, the American occupation of Japan in 1952. That peace treaty stated that nothing in this provision shall, 
prevent the stationing or retention of foreign armed forces in Japanese territory under or in consequence of any bilateral or multilateral agreements. So thus recognizing that stationing of foreign troops within the territorial limits of Japan was okay. I want to just show what some of the language used by the uh, Supreme Court was in their ruling. In the supplementary opinion written by Supreme Court Justice Tanaka Kotaro, he argued that uh, the Tokyo court had uselessly complicated what was a simple case of criminal trespassing. Nobody asked you to talk about the Constitution. This was simply a case of some seven students breaking into a U.S. base. Tanaka went on, even if there is a dispute as to the constitutionality of stationing of foreign troops, he wrote, or even going a step further and assuming that the presence of the troops is unconstitutional, as long as the presence of such troops is an actual reality, it behooves us to respect such presence. In a dazzling legal acrobatic performance, the justice argued that since the U.S. military was already stationed in Japan, it was not necessarily constructive to debate whether or not they were unconstitutional. For now, the court need only recognize that the bases should be afforded protection against trespassing. For Tanaka, the bases should be afforded the same protection as, say, uh, people unlawfully residing in Japan. He wrote, take the simplest example at hand, the presence of illegal entrants. As long as they remain, remain within our country, their life, liberty, property, and other rights must be protected. So that's right. He was comparing U.S. military bases to undocumented residents in Japan. Oops, I meant to show you that. There were no specific bases mentioned in the Supreme Court judgment, but we've seen that the Tachikawa base expansion project and the resistance it provoked were issues of immense national and even international importance. If the unconstitutionality of U.S. bases had been allowed to stand, then America's geopolitical strategy of using uh, Japan's geography as a bulwark against Asian communism would have been under serious threat. By 1959, the U.S. military gave up its plan to extend the runway, though the official announcement didn't come until much later, 1968, during the Vietnam War. In that year, the military announced it would be closing the base and reverting it back to Japanese sovereignty. And it is now today a Japanese self-defense force base. So in the book that I'm writing right now, you know, I look at anti-base protests throughout Japan this is just a, a zoom in on some of the bases that are in basically central Japan. Some of these, right, are in densely populated areas like, like uh, Tokyo and western Tokyo, others more remote. Some of these are joint use bases, uh, meaning that they're used by uh, or um, under the administration of both the Americans and Japanese self-defense forces. I'm just uh, double checking my time. I think I'm doing okay. Let me just sort of um, wind down um, a little bit um, before I get to uh, hopefully get some questions. Um, by thinking about the ways in which uh, a place like Sunagawa is remembered today. I've done a lot of field work in Sunagawa and interviewed a lot of people there um, over the years. And I'm always struck by the quiet of Sunagawa. It really does feel like a suburb. Um, a, a quiet suburb of an otherwise pretty bustling place, right, of Tokyo. And I would just say that, you know, this the anti-base opposition alliance that sort of coalesced around Sunagawa was emblematic of this wider spectrum of Japanese society that believed that continued militarization of Japan was an impediment to the promises that came with the end of the war. And that is the promise of demilitarization. So the people who joined the movements against militarism that continued throughout the entirety of the post-war years and continue today in Japan, as I, as I began this talk with, um, they found meaning with the Sunagawa struggle and even made pilgrimages to the site where the runway had been halted. So during the 1960s and the 1970s, many people actually wanted to visit that actual space, make these pilgrimages. Um, and along the base's northern fence, uh, where Sunagawa is, uh, you would see Japanese Communist Party banners, Japanese Socialist Party banners, 
um, labor union banners, you know, billowing in that region's really famous wind. <clears throat> in addition to that, there were locals on hand who would discuss their own experiences with the struggle and their ongoing efforts to get rid of the base completely, right? Whether it was an American base or a Japanese base, by the 1960s, those who opposed the base didn't care who administered it, right? They just wanted the base gone. Um, <clears throat> they would, uh, and built uh, monuments actually on the site. One way to commemorate the Sunagawa struggle was through the observance of what were called Sunagawa days uh, on the 15th of every month, a tradition among anti-base groups throughout the 1960s. These were initially created in order to observe the bloody battles that occurred in October of 1956, but they later went on to um, become moments to organize for other anti-base activities. In 1967, for example, uh, two of the um, leaders, sort of local farmers turned captains of the Sunagawa protest corps, uh, two gentlemen named Aoki Ichigoro and Miyako Masao, who I've mentioned before, <clears throat> attended several Japanese Communist Party rallies in order to help attract attention to the continuing anti-base movement. Their speeches at these rallies were not unusual. In addition to locals who were on hand, uh, you had uh, the construction of what are called kinenhi. Let me show you a picture of one. Uh, this large kinenhi is this, this, these big stone obelisks uh, that are often uh, erected at sites of commemoration. This one sits on the farmland that was the site of the struggle. This is the Stone of Peace. And it was erected on the land in 1975. So this is 20 years after the Sunagawa struggle uh, started with funds that were raised by the Alliance. And lastly, you know, one of the other people that I've talked to who continues to keep this memory of the Sunagawa struggle alive is this person. Her name is Fukushima Kyoko. And she's the daughter of Miyoka Masao, the person who I've uh, mentioned continually today. He was the person who saw the grasshoppers flying across the grassy uh, runways of his youth. He's also the person who uh, survived the, the wartime bombing in Sunagawa, and he's somebody who later uh, led protests against the base expansion project. And his daughter has sort of taken it upon herself to keep the memory of Sunagawa, uh, the Sunagawa struggle alive, and now uh, runs what she calls the Sunagawa Peace Plaza, which is basically a two-room community center, um, self-funded, um, that sits on the site of, again, that runway that was never built. Um, and it's there that she holds a kind of like, one day it could be a farmer's market, um, another day it could be a, a rally to uh, commemorate and show support for Article 9 of the, of the Constitution, that peace clause of the Constitution. So there are ways in which Sunagawa uh, reverberates today. Um, but again, there's kind of a quiet, a quietness to it today, especially when you think about uh, that history that I've talked about today of these immense protests of thousands of people. It's a very different place today, but that memory kind of lingers uh, in, in some ways. And I think that's the case for many of these other uh, protest movements, which um, if I had another four or five hours, I might, I might talk about. But perhaps um, with that, I can conclude this part of it um, and maybe uh, hand it back to Kyle or Heather and we can have... Um, if there's any questions, I can answer those. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Wright. That was an incredible talk. Um, we might want to stop sharing screen so we can all see each other. There we go. Uh, so we all see each other. We have lots of really great questions um, from our fantastic audience. Um, the first question that we'll start off with kind of a, a broad overarching question. Why did you become a historian and why Japanese history? What, what lit that spark for you? Thank you for this question. I love this question. It changes every time I get asked it, I think. But it, it um, you know, I didn't start off as a historian. I, I went to school um, <clears throat> uh, as, an, as I started college as a zoology major, sort of a zoology pre-med and uh, after a while of that, I just uh, wasn't really passionate about it. And I started taking Japanese language in college. Um, and that was my first sort of experience. My university at the time, a uh, small state school in Arizona called Northern Arizona University, um, uh, just started offering Japanese for the first time. And so I thought I would try it out. And uh, to nobody's surprise, I did horribly. 
the entire first year and and completely bombed um and i thought okay uh i have to retake all of these japanese classes because i will never get to go to grad school if i want to do that later on with uh, these horrible marks so i um found a study abroad program in Japan. My school didn't even have one set up at the time, so I had to go through another school and went to Japan. And it was finally going to Japan that I began to connect um, the language, of course, with the place. But I really began to see this is such a complicated, deep, wonderful, um, mesmerizing uh, place with a deep history. And I didn't know anything about it. And so that sort of my failure at Japanese language um, that prompted me to go to Japan sort of led to this snowball effect of, of realizing that, you know, <clears throat> as we all know, right, the, the more you learn, you realize the less you know sort of thing. And so that um, so I came back to, to school or to back to the U.S. and I retook my Japanese classes, did OK, um, and just sort of went forward. Um, but it wasn't later until uh, um, <clears throat> After working for a few years in other fields, uh, I worked at an NGO for a couple of years and, and eventually went back to uh, to get an, uh, an MA in Asian Studies. Um, and I eventually decided that a PhD, <clears throat> excuse me, a PhD in history was kind of more of my interest. Um, just because I, I decided, what, what are the things I like to read? And, uh, and I really was falling back on history. And, you know, this is also the time of, um, you know, so shortly after 9-11, and this is shortly um, around the time of, of the Iraq War, which I deeply opposed. Um, and, and, you know, some of the first protests I ever went to were, were uh, against the war. And so um, I was sort of combining, I think, a couple of things, which was uh, an increasing worry about American imperialism and what that looked like in the 21st century, but also combining that with this sort of really deep interest that I had in modern Japan and and I liked sort of looking at these social movements because I thought that they really pushed back against stereotypes that I often heard about Japan or even Asia in general, right? Which is that people are passive and they don't protest. And, and you know, there's all these kind of stereotypes about, about Asians that I had heard over and over again, which didn't reflect what I actually experienced. It didn't reflect what I saw in history. And so I was sort of putting these putting these elements together, I think, at that time. And, and that's kind of what led me, I think, into this kind of specific topic. Um, yeah, but it was, a, it was, it was not a, a straight route by any means to, uh, to becoming a historian. And one of the things I love uh, that you said, and that I love the idea, and I think this is so important for all of our students to hear is, is that our career paths are not, you know, determined at birth and you just follow and you just tick the boxes as you go. But I really love this connection to exploring world languages and different languages as, as an inspiration to do and find your path because it does, um, it's one of the most powerful ways to learn how different groups of people see the world and understand the world. And so I really, really appreciated that. Um, Heather, why don't you take the next question? I will take the next question. And I, given your uh, interest in imperialism, I think you'll like this question. Uh, you really describe the co you really describe the colonial like relationship that the U.S. military seemed to establish in this region as a result of their victory in the war. You talked a little bit about this, but I wonder if you could elaborate on how Sinagawa protesters drew on their identities as Japanese citizens in opposing U.S. military presence. How did nationalism shape their response, if any? Or was this a protest against militarism generally at the local level? A little bit of all of this? Yeah, what a great question. Um, yeah, you know, I think about the identities and, and the reasons why people, you know, show up to a, a, a protest, you know, and for any of you who have been to a protest, you know that it's it's not easy and it can be really nerve wracking actually, for me, for me anyway, and I've been to lots of protests, but um, it can be kind of nerve wracking um, to go. and so. I think that initially um, <clears throat> it wasn't necessarily that it was Americans that ran the base and that were the ones expanding it. There wasn't this deep sort of anti-American sentiment uh, pervading this moment, even though, as, as I mentioned, right, there are all these uh, environmental issues and social issues that are coming from the American base. <clears throat> but I think that many protesters um, in the 50s, as they do today, um, often sort of 
think about uh, the Japanese government's culpability in this situation, uh, maybe before they think of the American uh, fault in this. And the reason is because they, they you know, the J people in Japan know that it's, it's the Japanese government who gives permission to the Americans to, uh, to, to have these bases, to expand these bases, um, to, to fly their planes, right? That, none of that could happen if it weren't for the Japanese government um, uh, agreeing to that. And the Japanese government had a lot of reasons um, for that situation or for that uh, relationship. So it, it, yeah, so it's a good question. So I don't really see these early protests as being something about um, a Japanese nationalist sentiment that these foreigners are here kind of, uh, um, you know, ruining our, our, our space. Um, but that's not to say that, that that doesn't exist as well. If you, you put yourself into the mind as well of somebody in the 1950s, right, you've got the Korean War um, that's occurring from 1950 to 1953. That war would have looked really different without all of those American bases in Japan. Most of that war was being fought with soldiers and equipment that was in, at some point probably mostly coming from Japan. So Japan was really central. When a U.S. soldiers were injured, um, they were brought back to hospitals in Japan uh, at Tachikawa Air Base, for example. So, you know, the, 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 the clear link to the American bases in Japan to these wars that many Japanese people thought were not their wars, right? The war in, in Korea, the later war in Vietnam. Um, for, for some of the protesters, this felt um, there, there could be some sort of element of kind of a, a wider... Uh, um, Asian solidarity that was being broken by this relationship with the Americans, right? We, these bases in Japan are allowing, um, you know, they're leaving Japan to go and bomb other Asians, essentially. And so for some people, uh, some of the protesters, that that does become uh, certainly part of their uh, understanding of it, of, of their relationship and why they oppose these bases. You know, other people understood this in a global context, right? I, I think in, in my book, I, I tend to argue primarily that we think of military bases as um, part of American empire, right? Or part of this big system. But for the people who live around them, they're a local issue. They're a local thing, right? People aren't necessarily thinking about these wider geopolitical uh, strategies and issues and, and Cold War politics when they look at the base across the street every day, right? They're thinking of more simple everyday things. Simple is the wrong word, but more everyday uh, everyday sort of scenario, but that's not always the case. I mean, you, people were looking at, um, you know, the, uh, the Hungarian uprising against the Soviet Union, uh, which occurred um, during this this heated moment, late fifties, uh, and you know, people in Sunagawa were attuned to these issues, and they said, you know, this uprising in in, in Hungary uh, against the Soviets looks feels a lot like what we're trying to do against the American military here. So finding this sort of um, recognition with these other global um these other movements that were very much fueled by cold war politics that's a big politics question right that, that they're finding so there's a lot of uh yeah i i hope i answered that question but there's a lot of different reasons why people came into this and, and, and into the protests and some of which were nationalistic and, and some of it were more um maybe a little more basic yeah, I, I actually thought that was a great answer. I, I love how you focused on the how complex it is and how varied it is for each individual. And it was just a little bit of a smattering of sort of like this top down approach to history where we see things on this sort of global level, but also you're flipping it around and reminding us and reminding our students to think about the bottom up side of it too. Like what does this base really mean for people who are living, as you said, across the street from it? I really, I thought you did a, that was an excellent answer. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Wright, I think this actually, we've gotten a few questions related to this, which I'm going to kind of sort of merge together, but it really does kind of, um, what I'm about to ask kind of ties into this too, in terms of where people are living and what they're thinking. Um, uh, a few folks have asked if you could talk a little bit more about the protests that occurred in more rural or extremely rural areas. So why were there protests in, in um, these smaller communities or rural areas? And did these pro rural protests have connection with the United Red Army or any different um, national character. Um, if you could maybe speak to that a little bit, because it definitely is, 
um, certainly as someone who studies rural places, although in a very different part of the world, I can say um, it's really interesting to see these political movements emerge in, you know, in um, less, less densely populated areas. Yeah, that's another really um, great question. You know, I'm reminded of, of something that um, one of the, uh, so this is not like really rural, but Sunagala, right? So it's kind of suburban. Um, but looking at that, uh, at that space, one of the uh, um, sort of uh, journals that I was looking through of, of one of the protesters, she was re reflecting on these students from Tokyo who, uh, because of Sunagawa's proximity to Tokyo, students could go to class at the university and then hop on a bus and be out in Sunagawa in like an hour. So you could, you could actually get there. That's partly why there were such big numbers there of, of people. Uh, protesting, but this uh, the woman who who was writing this journal. She was a housewife, farmer, um, but she said, "Yeah, you know, I was kind of surprised when the students started showing up um, because politically we had nothing in common." She said, "Like I'm a farmer. I'm sort of conservative by nature, right? That's kind of like, um, and these students are coming in with these, you know, these really kind of uh, radical ideas." Um, but she said, "You know, they're really polite and they clean up after themselves and and they help out around the house and stuff." So you know, great, you know, God bless them. But, but she said, we, we, you know, politically, we have um, almost nothing in common except for this one thing, right? Except for this, this issue with the space expansion. So, you know, that kind of, uh, I think, suggests um, what you see as well in these more rural protests, which is that people were, were not, um, or were fir first and foremost um, protesting against bases because either the bases disrupted their livelihoods by um, some sort of environmental hazard or by the occupation of landscapes, um, or uh, uh, um, the bases endangered them by the practices that they that the bases were doing. So a lot of these rural bases were often uh, firing ranges. So they could be like missile training ranges or, or gun ranges and things like that. Those were a lot of what you saw in the rural areas. So they were loud and dangerous uh, for those reasons. But very often, you know, some of the earliest protests in, in against spaces, the first one that occurred, um, or one of the first, actually occurred during the occupation when it was really illegal to do this, uh, any kind of protest against the Americans. Uh, and this occurred um, in a place called Kuju Kurihama, which was on the east coast of, of um, the Kanto area uh, along the ocean. And a farming community there, uh, sorry, a fishing community there, um, was protesting against the Americans who were who were uh, using their beach and their sea uh, to practice amphibious landing drills, the kinds that that would become you know a big part of uh, American uh, strategy in in Korea. Um, the same thing was happening uh, in in another place called Uchinada, which is on the west coast of Japan. So entirely different parts of Japan. But both of these were sort of uh, fishing communities whose uh, seas were being disrupted by this these training um, training for these amphibious landings. Uh, so the people there again were were um, not necessarily uh, you know thinking about this wider geopolitical strategy of of or interrupting this bigger you know U.S. Japan alliance. But they're really focused on uh, their everyday livelihood, right? The fish. They notice don't come around when there's a lot of you know uh, firing going on and these other big amphibious vehicles running back and forth across the beach and through the sea, right? The fish are gone, right? That was their basic sort of uh, reason for coming out. And, and in both of those places, they occupied the beaches and refused to let those amphibious vehicles come onto the beaches or as best they could. So you know that in, in the in those rural areas. Um, very often, I think that the, the the reasons for protesting were were along those lines, right? That everyday livelihoods were being disrupted. It's a huge impact on these people's lives. I mean, I think that um, rural people are oftentimes rendered invisible, um, but it's like this completely transforms not only the way that they earn their money, but the way that they just live their day to day. Um, and yeah, no, that's really a great answer. Thank you for answering that. Um, yeah. Heather. Yeah, go ahead. Just add too that you know, yeah. that, you know, we it's we need to remember as well what Japan was like in the late '40s, early '50s. We think of Japan today as a you know nation of a plenty and and lots of 
um, all this great technology and, and uh, you know, longevity and all this. But, you know, late 40s, early 50s, it was still a place that was reeling from from uh, the war. And, yeah. and uh, you know, places still suffered um, uh, severe food, um, uh, lack of food, uh, malnourishment, and all of that. Uh, so, you know, you're disrupting livelihoods, but you're really also disrupting, like, how people can eat day to day in, in much of rural Japan. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, terrible. And then <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> Absolutely awful, but wonderful answer. Go ahead. <laughs> um, all right. So the next question is, has the rebuttal successfully used by the um, Tajikawa and Sunagawa community ever been used as a legal precedent to reduce base presence in Okinawa? If so, why was this not successful as evidenced by Okinawa still bearing the disproportionate burden of military base hosting in Japan? So if not, why not? I mean, that's a, that's a really great question as well. Um, you know, the, the, the legacy of Sunagawa, uh, I think lives on more so in sort of uh, um, activist imaginaries about uh, possibilities for for um, you know winning against base expansions than it does in the in the legal world. Um, it's not to say that the, the you know the, the case in Sunagawa was really remarkable, um, you know, for the reasons that basically the Tokyo court uh, made the ruling that it did. But because the Supreme Court sided with the government, that sort of made it you know um, a settled issue that the bases were not unconstitutional. Um, because the Supreme Court sided with the government. And, you know, the vast majority of the time in legal cases that go up to the Supreme Court, um, I won't venture a number, but it's super high, the proportion of times that the, the Supreme Court sides with the, with the Japanese government uh, is, is really high. So it's, um, in, in some ways, right, it, it, the precedent and the legacy of the, the, of the legal case um, doesn't really hold much uh, it doesn't really, it's not really useful for, I think, uh, contemporary protests uh, against the base in the realm of, in the, in the courts, just because it's, it's already been settled. There was another court case, um, the Eniwa incident, that came about um, a few years after the Sunagawa incident. And it was kind of a similar, a similar type of case that, that went up through the courts, except in this case, it was against a self-defense force base. Up in Hokkaido, and the self-defense forces again are the Japanese self-defense forces. So it wasn't an American base; it was a Japanese base. But you know, a, a similar um, type of argument came into the court, and again, once again, the court uh, said, you know, no, military bases are not war potential. Military bases do not violate Article Nine. And so I think that because it was settled um, in that way, uh, you know, I don't know that that people are. are really trying to use article nine as a as a way to argue against the presence of bases today even though as as that questioner rightly acknowledges you know that places like okinawa you would think that would be the place where you would apply the 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 potential for a legal case um would probably come from okinawa which which hosts you know uh, a huge proportion of american bases you know the main island of okinawa um for those of us, many of us are in the Bay Area. You know, the main island of Okinawa is pretty small. It's about the size of Kauai. It's about the the size of like Santa Cruz, where I used to live, up to about San Francisco. So kind of that that bigger peninsula kind of uh, kind of range. And and uh, you know, twenty percent of that is occupied by American bases in Okinawa. So it's it's a lot, right? It's a it, they're very much condensed. There are there are U.S. bases throughout Japan. Um, but because they're so deeply condensed in Okinawa, sometimes the, the weight there feels heavier, I think. Great answer. Thank you for that. And also thank you. And I know our students thank you for giving them that geographical reference. So they have a, a sense for, for, for place and size and scale. So thank right. you. So the next question, we actually have had a few questions about your experience doing field research, going out um, into the field to work in archives and to connect with um, different sources. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what that experience is like, what were the great parts and maybe what were the challenges? And then there's a second part to this question. So maybe I'll have you answer that part first and then I have a very sort of specific part. 
about your experience working in Japan. Okay, yeah. I I mean, I love uh, doing field work and it's like one of the highlights. I There were so many times when, you know, I was like a grad student and I, you know, I'd go to a Japanese language school in Japan and sneak away and go do some some field work or something. And, and there were so many moments when I was doing that, when I was like, I, I can't believe that I get to do this as part of like, you know, my work, I get to go and talk with these people and, and go into an archive. Like, I, it's just, I felt so incredibly lucky, but you know, it, it's, um, I, you know, I, I didn't know a lot about how to do field work. I just kind of made it up as I went along. I, you know, I wasn't an anthropologist. I didn't get trained in, in sort of, in sort of these, uh, this kind of world. Um, you know, I met a lot of the people that I interviewed. Uh, it was often just kind of word of mouth, right? There wasn't like this necessarily a, a network that I could sort of tap into easily. Um, but a lot of it, I, I would just sort of um, look at uh, people's blogs. Um, I would look at different kind of activist um, organizations in different cities. And sometimes a name would pop out and I would reach out to them. And very often, I mean, people were were so generous with their time and, and you know, this is this was my experience in Japan, and that uh, uh, people were really eager to to have maybe because I'm American, uh, talk to an American about these these types of issues, right? And to kind of maybe they felt that uh, these histories are not well known in in the U.S. Um, and that they wanted them to be sort of uh, talked about more. Um, so you know, I think that people were always really willing to, to talk with me and. In general, if you're interviewing protesters or activists, right, these are people who are out in the public. So they're typically people who want their opinions and their experiences to be known, right? They're not shy or, or I mean, it's not that they're not shy, but, they, you know, if, if you're going to show up at a protest or if you're going to be an activist, you're probably somebody who wants to engage and get your opinion out, right? So it's not that they were hard to um, to talk to in any kind of way, right? Uh, so that, in, in some ways, that, that made it... Uh, made it pretty easy. Um, but it was, you know, it was a great way to um, see so many different parts of Japan, finding a contact, emailing them a, back and forth a couple of times, scrounging together a bit of money and saying, look, I can be in, in Iwakuni, for example, um, for three days next week. Do you think maybe you and I could drive around and you could show me some, some sites, right? Um, had, you know, that kind of experience several times um, in Japan. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, 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 I don't, I'm not a professional field uh, ethnographer by any sense uh, in, in any way, but it's just been um, uh, something I've kind of learned along the way. The thing about field work in, in a place like Japan too is, you know, we often think about archives as the, the home of historians, and I've certainly um, spent my fair share of time in archives. But what I love about Japan is that uh, there are lots of these kind of mom and pop archives. You know, people really kind of get the sense like, you know, our little spot of this planet or our little spot of this historical moment is important. And we're going to collect everything we have and store it here. And, and so there were, you know, lots of these like neighborhood archives and neighborhood um, kind of experts, neighborhood historians who uh, uh, um, were happy to talk. So I, I don't know if that's a particularly Japanese thing. Maybe it is. But it was a, it was that also made it um, made it. It wasn't that hard to find these kinds of stories. Right. There were people happy to talk yes and actually i my experience in smaller archives especially rural archives is that it's much it's much more dynamic and interesting i'll leave it at that but there's definitely a lot more engagement um and a lot of pride um in a lot of cases too which is really interesting it's interesting you actually kind of touched on the second question which is um were japanese folks inter you know interested and open to talking to you as an american about their sophisticated feelings about the about American military occupation you kind of spoke to this idea that they actually were, were very much so it seems like yeah I think I think um I think a lot were you know I think that there's kind of this there was a um sometimes there was a dual purpose to it of, of people maybe being so um inviting for me to come to for example to go listen in on their protest rally um I remember one case in um this is again in Iwakuni Iwakuni is in, in sort of getting into southwestern Japan in Yamaguchi Prefecture, not far from Hiroshima. Um, but there's a big American military uh, marine base there that's been there since the end of the war. 
Um, and like a lot of the big bases, that was also a Japanese military base before the war. And so the Americans uh, took that over. Um, but I was there and I, I went to this uh, rally that was uh, organized by a lot of locals who were in opposition to a new U.S. military residence uh, kind of neighborhood that was being built off the base, kind of up in these hills outside of the town. And, and these locals uh, didn't want it to be built. So somebody invited me to go and just listen in. Uh, on, on what people were saying. And and I, I came to find out, though, that, you know, by my presence being there, um, an outsider, uh, for the for the organizers of an event like this, they could sort of point the camera a little bit at me and show, look, this this event, this this issue has such importance. It's not just us locals who are concerned about it. Look, there's even there's even a foreigner here. There's an American. Um, who is also concerned. So it's not, you can't just say that it's a bunch of locals who are, are, are complaining about, about this issue. So of course that wasn't like my intention of being there. Right. But, but I could see that that's what, what many of the, um, some of the locals there were, were doing and um, which is fine. And, you know, it, these are complicated, complicated places. I'll tell a story. I met, I met a guy at this, at this rally. He was a, you know, he's probably in his seventies and he ran a construction company in Iwakuni. Um, and he was at this rally and I'm just listening. And after it ends, he comes up to me and he says, Hey, I want to tell you a story. And he, uh, he says, uh, one time I was protesting outside of the American base in Iwakuni and this is like 1980 and uh, a bunch of MPs grabbed me and, and dragged me into the base and took me into a room and interrogated me for a couple of hours and screamed and yelled at me and, and, um, and really terrified me, you know, pointed guns at me and stuff. And, and, uh, asked me why I was protesting, like accused me of being a communist and all of this. And, and then, uh, they threw him, they threw him out. They just kind of, you know, rattled his cage for, for a few hours. Um, so I, I said, Oh, this is a really interesting story. Can I, can I hear more about it? Maybe we could sit down and I could record an interview. And so the next day I went to his house and heard this story. And the more I started talking to him, I said, Oh, so you're a construction worker. Where, where do you do a lot of your work? And he said, Oh, on the base. And so I said, Oh, hold on. So you, uh, you were protesting the base on Saturday, but you would work there Monday through Friday. And he's like, yeah, I worked there for like 20 years. And then he shows me, he's got like certificates of, of, um, what are they not achieve, but like appreciation from like the base commander for all of his great work. He used to go and, and get drinks and barbecued chicken with the base commander all the time. He liked to go on the base. He likes to play golf with the base commander. So he's like, He's, he's, it's a, it's a, I tell the story to show just how complicated these places are, right? I mean, he's, he's not anti-American, clearly, right? It's not that. He's very specific about, about what, what his opposition is, right? And it was to uh, the use of these spaces, these certain spaces for, uh, you know, expansion of military bases and things like that. So that was one of those moments of, of interviewing somebody that I, I, I really cherish. But I also, it really taught me to not make assumptions, right? To really, um, understand how complicated people are. That's a great, that is a great story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it with us. I really, yeah, really does highlight how complicated uh, things are and how important it is to not bring our own bias and our own assumptions uh, into our research with us. Um, so we have time for just one more question. So I'm, we're gonna actually close with this last question, uh, which is a recommendation request. What historical novel would you recommend relating to Asian history? Oh man, what historical novel would I recommend related to Asian history? Mm -hmm. Okay. It could also be even a piece of nonfiction that's like maybe more introductory and more narrative too, more based in story. If you're struggling with historical fiction, I don't read a whole lot of historical fiction as a historian, as it turns out. So I would not be able to answer this question. I, <laughs> I mostly focus on scholarship. So yeah. I mean, you know, um, yeah. So it's not historical fiction. It 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 is a novel that was you know, it, but it's it's an actual from the time uh, novel Great. that that I would recommend, and it's called um, the Crab Canning Ship. And, and I've used this thing, I've, I've assigned this in classes before, um, and it's a novel uh, that is written in, I'm going to say the 1920s, uh, by a, a young writer 
Um, and it's very much like a proletarian novel. Um, and it gets the writer in trouble. But it's about, it's, it's about that. It's about the crew of a crab canning ship operating in the cold, inhospitable um, Ohotsuka Sea in northeast Japan um, in the 1920s. And they're totally exploited. The whole thing serves as kind of a parable of, of capitalist society, right? So you've got the, the greedy captains sort of demanding the slave labor uh, of, of the, the people working in the bowels of the ship. And you've got these militarists who are sort of colluding with the, um, with the, uh, the captains of the ship. So, you know, it's, it's really overt in that way, but it's just such a, it's just such a fun story. And it's still really popular um, in Japan. It gets resurgences every time there's kind of a, um, you know, like when there was the economic uh, meltdown in 2008 and everybody hated banks, uh, this book became a runaway bestseller again. And like there was a, there's a, there's a manga version of it. Um, there's a film about it, but that's a, that's a great book to just kind of give you this little window into, um, into exploitative life in the 1920s in, in Japan. All right. And Sounds like a, a great recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, I put a link. It's the Amazon link. All apologies, but I was acting on the fly um, for folks who are interested in this book. It looks really fantastic, actually. I kind of want to read it. Um, so we're going to come to a close, and we want to thank you, um, Dustin, for joining us here at the Lytton Center and for your incredible talk and this really wonderful Q&A. Um, thank you for enriching the lives of all of us um, uh, in attendance today and sharing all of your great research and some really great stories um, with us as well. Um, I also want to thank our incredible interpreters, um, Genevieve and Vanessa. We have the best interpreters at Ohlone, so I'm, hopefully my sass is coming through um, the interpretation, because um, we do. We really do have the best um, interpreters, and we really appreciate all of the um, support that we've had from our interpreter teams this entire year um, doing great Litton Center events. This is our last um, Litton Center event for um, the academic year as we're closing up the spring semester. Um, and it has been a banner year for us and we've been able to share the work of really incredible scholars um, and have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of folks actually from all over the United States um, join us here. Um, we're really looking forward to the fall. We've already began um, begun to plan our speaking events and other activities for the fall. So we hope you'll continue to follow along with us and join us um, in the fall and beyond. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the center, you can visit our website, which is aloni.edu slash Litton Center. Um, and that actually, that site has links to our social media as well, including Facebook, um, because, you know, who doesn't love Facebook? Um, so you can follow us there as well and get uh, more information and more news about what we do. Um, and we really look forward to um, seeing you at future events. And as we um, move out of COVID. Hopefully, some we will start some on-campus events very soon. We're very excited about that. So thank you again, Dr. Wright, um, for joining us, and we will see everyone um, hopefully very soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it.